so much for joining us this morning. We're just going to turn our hearts to God. We're going to teach you a song this morning. This is called Bring Us in the Garden. It goes like this.
captive in fear. To be captive in fear is to paralyze us from what you've called us to be. To be captive in fear is following Satan and letting him have control of our thoughts and our lives. God, when that happens, it paralyzes us. And it's not to be cautious yet. It's not to be disrespectful. It's not to be careless. But it is to embrace your love, your goodness, your glory. God, there's such a hurting world. And they're looking for answers. And it is the church that should be standing in the gap. Confident, you will see all of this and so much more through. So, Heavenly Father, let us just own today that our fear doesn't stand a chance. We are living as the people you have called us to be. We pray all of this in your Son Jesus' amazing name. We pray it so calm. Well, grace and peace, friends. Great, Pastor. Hey, thank you. I uh, I just want to welcome all of you that are in house in person today, and, and also uh, those of you that are watching live on Facebook. Uh, folks that are watching live from home, we're trying something a little different with the microphone today. Uh, so you may have to turn your volume up on your TV. Uh, you may have to sit a little closer rather than running and getting that other cup of coffee that you're having right now, but uh, we're just, we had a little mic issue last week, so we're trying to correct that, but uh, I want to talk just for a moment as I'm welcoming you about those words, grace and peace, because someone said recently to me, why do you always say the same thing every Sunday morning? Well, for one, for a couple of reasons, first, if there's a first time guest here, they may not know that I'm Kevin and I serve as a pastor in Crossway but also those words, grace and peace, they're, they're biblical, they're theological. There's a, there's a deep meaning in that. And so it's a wonderful way, especially in, uh, in these days where we're uncertain of handshakes and hugs and who wants to and who doesn't. Uh, it's a great way to just greet someone in the name of the Lord and just say grace and peace, friends, or grace and peace, sister, or grace and peace, brother. Well, I just also want to say thanks for being here. Thanks for joining online. Uh, I'm glad that you have taken this time to be in this space to join with us in worshiping the Lord God. Our worship music this morning was awesome. It brought us into the presence of God. We've got more to come. So hang on, keep listening, and, uh, and go and, and join us. I want to invite you, if you have your Bible with you this morning or, uh, or today, or maybe you've just got that Bible on your Bible app, I want to invite you to go ahead and open it at this time to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, just the tail end of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 uh, through 32. Then we're going to pick up the first two verses of chapter 5, and this is going to be our focus verses for this morning. This is what we're going to focus on as we wrap up this very brief two-week message series, Are You Like Jesus? So let's uh, let's turn to the Bible and let's see what God's Word has to say to us today. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you do. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind. Be kind with each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. May God add a blessing to our hearing, to our reading, and to our understanding of his words. 
one Sunday, a, a little girl was on her way home from church with, within the car with mom and dad. And, uh, and as they were driving along, very much like this picture, she was kind of staring out the window. And, and suddenly she said, Mom, there's something the pastor said this morning that, that I'm kind of wondering about. I've been thinking on. And, uh, she, and the mother said, well, what's that? Well, the little girl said, he told us today that God is bigger than we are. He said that God is so big that God can hold the world in his hands. Is that really true? And her mother kind of smiled a little bit and said, yes, I, I believe that that's true. But mom, the pastor also said that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, that God comes and lives inside of us. Is, is that true? And again, the mother reassured her daughter by saying, yes, I, I believe it's true, and I believe what the pastor said is true. So a few more miles passed, and the little girl kind of looked out the window thinking on that. And finally she said, but if God is bigger than us, but he lives inside of us, wouldn't he kind of show through? And you know, isn't that really the point? Isn't that really the point of our lives? To have Jesus showing through. To have Jesus in so big that we can't contain it in, in our smiles, in our actions, in our words. As Christians, isn't that what we should be striving for? Is when we meet people, when we meet, whether they're family, friends, co-workers, total strangers, that when we meet people, that Jesus is in some way just completely and totally, totally visible through us, that, that we can't contain Jesus. By the way, um, for those of you that, that may not know me as well as others, I do have a tendency to get <coughs> energetic up here sometimes. Today, a little more so, I've just come back from a weekend at church family camp. I spent the week with, uh, with a few others, Mike and Lane and Roland Dees and, uh, and uh, Jackie and Bella and Jack that are back there, their family, the Lanes. And we had a wonderful time. It wasn't just us. We joined the uh, forces. <laughs> That's not the We came together with the Asigo United Methodist Church. It was beautiful and it was wonderful. And, and I promise you'll hear a little bit more about that. But, but when I come back from the time of rest, Seems to me, I get a little more rambunctious than normal. So, yeah, it's all right. You guys can tell me to slow down if I need to. But, uh, but Jesus, Jesus being visible in our lives, it shouldn't be just a Sunday morning thing. It should happen in our homes. It should happen in our places of work or school or uh, out in our community when we go these days to restaurants, stores, whatever it might be. Aspect of our lives. Wouldn't it be cool if there's something different that people just go, I can't put my finger on it, but. Or if they come up and go, wow, something has changed in you. <laughs> so I want you to, as you're thinking about that, I want you to, uh, to look and listen for a moment to these words from the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the churches in Corinth. He said, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So I want us to, to take a minute or two here and, and just let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, it's really important that we see that Paul is writing to all of us. And I love those words because I believe that all of us doesn't just mean you and I that are in this space. It means all of us, the whole world, for God so loved the world, all of us who have the veil removed. Now, that changes things a little bit because that removal of the veil, or some of your Bibles might say unveiled faces, that's that idea that, that we have become Christian, we become followers of Jesus, and that the old has been removed and the new is showing through. Um, I like to say that our slate has been wiped clean. You can imagine our chalkboard full of who we used to be has just been wiped clean. 
clean and we are brand new. That veil has been removed. Another way to look at this is, this is saying that that veil has been removed through the power of Jesus Christ. Satan no longer has the control on our lives, right? We don't have to listen to Satan trying to tell us what we can't do or what we used to be. The veil has been removed and now we can listen to God tell us who we are and who God knows we can be. But there's a little more to that. So it's not only just talking to those of us who are Christian, but look what else it says. Those whose veil has been removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. We can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. When that veil has been removed, when we become followers of Jesus, we are to be a mirror to the world of what Jesus is supposed to look like, of what Jesus is supposed to be. And again, I'll just keep coming back to this all over the place this morning. When people meet us, they should be able to see the light and love of Jesus in who we are, in our everyday life, how we act, how we talk, how we smile, whistle, clap our hands, raise our hands like this, or hold a television, right? I keep referring to that. However, we worship. But I want to bring you to another point here in the second half. So, all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him. The Holy Spirit, each and every day, makes us more and more like Jesus. How cool is that? How cool is that to get up every day just before your feet plant on the floor and say, Thank you, God, for this day. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that I'm going to be a little more like Jesus today. Again, so that, remember if you were here last week, we, we, we highlighted that phrase that was in our scripture reading, so that, so that all of this happens so that Jesus will be seen in us, will be seen in our lives, in our actions, and who we are, so that others may come to know Jesus. So, it's second service, it's 10.30, 11 o'clock. Some of you are here, you had to get up, get showered, get dressed. Some of you are still at home and you're comfy DJs, and that's okay. But most of you had a chance to get up and get moved around. So my question is, what if Jesus took your place this morning with your family? What if when you got out of bed, you looked like you, but everything you said and did was just like Jesus? Or what if tomorrow, for those of you that, that need to go to the office or go to work or wherever it may be, what if tomorrow you look like you, but Jesus takes your place? And so everything that happens at work looks and sounds like Jesus. Or what if you're going to have school tomorrow, which most of you aren't in summer vacation, right? Unless you've got a really mean mom. But yeah, what if you're going to... I'm kidding, Jackie. I'm kidding. Well, what if you're going to have school tomorrow? And so... Instead of you coming to school, Jesus takes your place. My friends, what if, instead of me standing up here on the stage, what if it just looks like me, but Jesus took my place? How might things be different? How might things, maybe the words that were said at home this morning as you were getting ready for church, or quite often when our children were younger, the words that were said in the car on the way to church, Whether we want to always think about it or admit it or think we can do it, we are to reflect Jesus to the world. That's what this passage tells us. We are to be a reflection of Jesus. And that's not just what the Apostle Paul wants from us. That's what Jesus wants from us too. As followers of Jesus, Jesus wants us to reflect his life and his love to the people in the world around us. Jesus wants us make Jesus known. And, and we don't have to quote scripture, you know, chapter and verse in order to do that. The greatest way that you and I can make Jesus known is just by being the person that Jesus is within us. By our words, our actions, and telling our story. So I just want to ask for a minute, think about this. Isn't that what you want for your family? 
Isn't that what you want for maybe your friends and your co-workers, those that are in your, your, your circle of best and closest friends? Don't you want those that you know that don't yet know Jesus to come to know Jesus? Isn't that really what our heart's desire is? That's what this message is about. Are we like Jesus? How can we become more and more like Jesus so others will want to know what it is that's different about us so that we can share our story so that they can come and, and experience that same hope and joy and grace and mercy? So the question we've been looking at is, are you like Jesus? And if we were all honest, we would mostly probably check that no box, right? Because we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We make mistakes. But when I'm talking about are you like Jesus, I do need to clarify that I'm not talking about we let our hair grow long and we grow a beard and we begin to wear robes and sandals all the time. <laughs> this is not that, okay? But are we like Jesus? Do we in our everyday lives, at home, at work, at school, wherever that may be, Facebook, Instagram, wherever it may be, do our words, do our actions reflect the life and love? Does our, do they reflect who Jesus is and what Jesus expects of us? Because I believe that, that that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was urging us to do in our reading from Ephesians. And I want to take us back to, to uh, verse uh, 1 and 2 in, in, in chapter 5. It says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children. Little life filled with love. Following the example of Christ. Are you like Jesus? You know, the Bible is filled with these wonderful stories that tell us all about Jesus. And, and what we can learn from the Bible is this. Jesus was generous. Jesus was generous with his time. Jesus was generous with his love. He was authentic in his care. I like that word, authentic. That's what we need to be. The Jesus that shows from us needs to be authentic, which means... The Jesus that shows out of you is not going to be the same Jesus showing out of me. We each have our own authentic piece of Jesus to share with the world. But Jesus was authentic in his care for others, his compassion for others. He was also very authentic in his relationship with God. And I want to bring that up because Jesus was so much so that way that nowhere in the Bible were you, will you read that it says that Jesus was a teacher of sinners. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus was a changer of sinners. But the Bible does tell us that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus was so authentic in his life and his love and his care and compassion that he was a friend to sinners. So think for a moment. And this is to make you a little uncomfortable in your chair, but I don't want you to dwell there too long. Because remember, folks, the veil has been removed, right? And, and we have, we are followers of Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit making us new every day. But what kind of friend do people find you? Do we look like Jesus? And do our do our lives at all times, in our hearts, and our nature, truly reflect His glory, or? We find ourselves too often just trying to imitate Jesus, trying to make ourselves look as much as possible like Jesus. Are we impersonating Jesus? That's a tough one. It's not a lot of that one. But it's true. Sometimes I find myself impersonating the very Savior that I love. And I don't say that because I want us to feel bad because there's hope and there's joy. Remember, what did that scripture say? The veil has been removed, right? The old is gone, the new is come, and we've got this thing called who? The Holy Spirit. This person, sorry, I said thing, this person. The Holy Spirit that day by day, little by little, makes us more and more like Jesus. So, if our goal is to become more like Jesus, 
makes sense then that a good place to start might be sounding more like Jesus. And so I want to take us back to a little bit of what we read earlier. Verse 29, we began with these words. Let everything you say be good and helpful. So that, turn to somebody and say so that, or you just talk to yourself. It's okay, say it. So that, it's important. So let's start again. You guys fill in those words. If you're at home, you can't cheat and skip this. I expect to hear you. All right? So here we go. Everything you say, let everything you say be good and helpful. So that. Your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. I told you I went to family here. I had no idea exactly what to expect. I had no idea what I was going to experience. I had no idea that some of those ICO folks that have been doing this for 40 years did what they did. It was incredible. But I just got to be honest. I, I went to family camp this week with a purpose on my own. God and I were going to have a conversation. Well, God was going to listen. I'm just going to do a lot of talking. Because that's what I do. But Karen came last Sunday and helped me get camp set up. And then... She left early in the morning on Monday and went to work and didn't come back until Wednesday night. And, and I had, in between, I had time by myself. And I had time with those from the church that were there, time with the folks from Otsiko. And God began working on my heart and began talking to me about this veil that had been removed and, and began speaking to me about, is it Satan who's speaking into my life about what I can't do and what I'm not able to do or listening to God and says, here's what you need to do, and you can do this. And then Friday, Friday, I got a soul. I got a piece of lava rock. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, I still haven't checked it out completely true, but, but I guess there's some kind of a volcanic thing that happens in Lake Michigan, and, and sometimes it spits up some lava rock, and this rock has been washing up on the shores of Lake Michigan, and the director of camp said, if you're down on the beach, look, you might find a piece of lava rock. I didn't find any. But a little girl that was there, and she's going to remain nameless today, I'll tell you her name later in another message, but she found a nice piece of lava rock, and, and as her family was on the way back to the beach, Karen was gone with my granddaughter to Beckwater, and I was sitting Friday working on this message and trying to figure out some final touches, and and all of a sudden I heard, Master Kevin, Master Kevin, look what we found. And, and it was this palm-sized, really light hunk of cinder is what it looks like, if you know. And uh, she was so excited, and I was excited. And I said, wow, that's really cool. Can I take a picture of it? And so I set it down, and I took her picture. I've got it on my phone. And, and, and then she said, her sister said, well, we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to leave. Our family's got to go. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll see you when I see you. And off they went. I went back to working on my message. And a few minutes later, I heard, heard her voice again go, Pastor Kevin. And I turned, and she held out that stone, and she said, here, I want you to have it. And I accused her. Well, actually, I accused her mother. I said, did your mother make me come and do this? And she said, no. And I cried, just like I'm doing now, because I was such a... That was a true treasure that she found. Not everybody was finding this, and she was willing to give that father lot to me. And so I said, she said, well, i got to go. My family's leaving. And I said, well, wait, I'm going to walk with you and say goodbye to everybody. And so as we're walking along, I asked her a question that was on my heart. Why would you do this? Why would you give me your treasure? And she said, because you talked about Jesus, and I worked your way to love Jesus.
Do you believe that? God's love story is printed in the Bible. It's from page one to page whatever. It's in the Bible. It's but our story to tell is not that story. We don't have to quote chapter and verse, but God's love story is, is a story. It's sharing about a little girl who gives the pastor a rock at just the right time on just the right day. At just the right moment to remind me of who God's called me to be, of that veil has been removed, and this is my new gift, and this is my new thing. God's love story to tell. It's our, it's our job to tell it. Well, guess what? Only we can tell it. I've got my own story to tell. You've got your story to tell. And I know some of you are sitting out there right now and going, ah, and, 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 and that's, that's your thing. That's your time. I don't know. We all have that story. We all have that story. Whatever it might be, it's our story to tell. So, if we're going to ever show people Jesus, if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to sound like Jesus, right? We've got we to sound like Jesus in our words. But, but as I shared in that story, we've also got to act like Jesus. And so, I want you to look again at this verse. Be kind to each other. And kindness is kind of the short supply, it seems like, these days. And it is just an odd season that we were in. It's a tough season. Be tender, be tender hearted. You know, I, I read those words and I think about some of what I see on Facebook. I try really, really hard to use Facebook just for ministry purposes. You'll see me post very little else on there. But man, I see some, I'm just going to say it, some nasty stuff on there. Some really not very kind and tender hearted things on there. And folks, we need to remember. Sometimes we think we are, okay, we think we're being Jesus. But is it kind and is it tender hearted? Are we forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven us? I'm not saying we all lay down to be doormats, okay? We've got to stand for right and justice, but and sometimes not only do we have to think about the words we use, but we've got to think about our actions and how do they depict our Jesus and we want the world to see Here's the good news. Because I beat you up a little bit. You're feeling kind of rough right now because I got some good news. And the good news is this. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, we've got the perfect pattern to follow. So I asked, I just came to my mind first service. I want to ask you to get here. How many here like to do jigsaw puzzles? All right, how many of you like to put together? How many of you don't really like jigsaw puzzles, but you put them together before? Thank you, Faith. Or Ray. Yeah, all right, good. I appreciate a few people supporting me. Now, here's the big question. Anybody here like to do jigsaw puzzles and not have a box top with a picture first? <laughs> we had one of the first years. Yeah, see, nobody likes to do a jigsaw puzzle when you don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But the good news is, we can look like Jesus, we can act like Jesus, we can be the reflection of Jesus to the world because Jesus gave us the perfect path. It's in the Bible. It's in the stories of Jesus. All we have to do is, is to be back to Jesus in the right context to the world. Jesus gave us the, the perfect pattern to follow to, to help bring people into God's presence, to, to help point them to the cross, to, to help them find the healing and the forgiveness and the grace and the love and the mercy that, that we've experienced that Jesus wants for them to experience. You know, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, I believe, are the perfect verses that, that really back up Crossman's vision saying, love and action showing people Jesus. Think about that. Love and action showing people Jesus. Then go back and look at those verses again. You'll see our vision is very, very biblical there. And, and if that's really what we want, then, then we've got to begin to live out these verses each and every day. There's a, there's a great story that, that came out of World War II, and it's a story about a, a young boy. He was an orphan boy, and he lived on the streets of, of Paris, and, um, and his everyday life basically consisted of just going through the streets and scrounging around for whatever food or shelter or clothing that he could find. And most people that he met in those days, because 
it was hard after following World War II, after all the devastation. Most of the people he met did one of two things. They either ignored him because he was a pesky little boy, or they just didn't have anything to offer him. He'd heard someone talk once about this guy named Jesus, but the results of the war and all that he experienced, all the loss and the devastation that he had already lived through in his just few young years, had just sapped away and sucked away any faith that he had in their being a savior. So one cold morning, he was wandering the streets of Paris, and he came to the local bakery, and he just stood outside the window because he knew that the baker wouldn't let him in. But he stood outside the window, and he just Watched. And he looked at all the bread and the rolls, and he watched the bakers in their kneading the dough, and all the smells that came out of that bakery just made his little empty stomach hurt. And he was so enthralled with the view through that window. Can you, can you picture him? Can you picture him right like this? Yeah, steam on there, and you're wiping it off. He was so enthralled with that that he, had, he didn't notice soldier that was watching him. He didn't even notice as that soldier walked right by him and walked into the store. But he did notice when that soldier stood at the counter and as that baker took a big paper bag and filled it with breads and rolls and all sorts of fresh baked goodies. And he also noticed when that soldier came out the door and walked right up to him and got down like this and met him right at his space, right where he was. Didn't say a word, just looked at him and gave him the, that bag of bread and rolls and, and all that delicious smelling stuff. I imagine the little boy felt a little bit like I did when I got that blah, blah, blah. But the little boy blurted out the very first thing that was was coming through his mind right then. He says, Mr. Are you Jesus? Wouldn't that be incredible? Wouldn't that be incredible to just be mistaken for Jesus? By how we live, by how we laugh, smile, talk, speak, write, by our everyday life, by our love and our actions, that others would notice Jesus and want to know, are you Jesus? Are you a Christian? Whatever that question is. And really, folks, with, with all that we have, even in the midst of this really weird time with all that, that God has given us, all of the blessings, really, shouldn't that be our goal? Shouldn't that be our goal each and every day to be a little more Well, I want to invite us to, to come to prayer at this time. And this morning, I'm going to invite us into a little bit different prayer. Um, I want you to, uh, originally I was going to put these words on the screen, but I'm, I want you to hear them. And I want you to, to pray them as they meet your ears and your heart. But I'm going to pray uh, these words that are famous uh, from St. Francis of Assisi. And so let's come together and pray, shall we? Lord, glorious and heavenly Father God, will you make each of us an instrument of your peace? Where there's hatred, will you let us be loved? And where there's injury, pardon. And where there's doubt, God, will you let us be the true faith in you? And where there's hope, God, help us, let us to be the hope in this world. And where there's darkness, let us be loved. And where there's sadness, joy. God, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. That we may not seek to be understood, but to understand. That we may not so much seek to be loved, but to love others. And then St. Francis ended with these beautiful words. For it is in giving that we receive, 
and it is in forgiving that we are forgiven, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Father God, this is our work. Let that be us. And we pray in this in all things, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.
you found speed, relevance, that you found yourself in the presence of God in some way that the Holy Spirit moved within you today. And I just want to uh, to remind you, uh, if you haven't already done so, I know many of you are watching.